This is Hunter Way at the Athletes Lodge Podcast. I'm here with my guest. Uh, Stan Gerard, head basketball coach at the University of Southern Indiana. So just starting off here, Coach, what do you think about your team so far this season? Well, nice guys. Uh, we work hard. Uh, had a very tough schedule, of course. Uh, actually, the top 60 toughest schedule in the country. Um, uh, I didn't foresee as being where we are from a, from a record standpoint, you know, especially with some of the games I thought they were winnable games. But, you know, it is what it is right now, and we just have to find a way to, you know, be great in conference play. But a very resi- resilient group. Uh, these guys come in every day and they work hard and, and trying to, you know, put set our feet in the stone in league play. And, um, you know, we cut off to a great start in league play um, you know, a couple, a couple uh, last week, rather, uh, at, at uh, Lindenwood and, and here at home against Tennessee State and dropped one, of course, against Tennessee Tech. But a very resilient group, uh, a lot of talent on this, on this team. Uh, we just haven't found our niche yet. And uh, that's, that's coming at some point, we hope. So you played some – you know, a couple of games against really big schools, you know, with Michigan State and Duke. So with those games, how do you think your team was able to, I guess, combat, you know, schools that are, you know, you expect those two teams to be in the Sweet 16 every year, you know? Absolutely. Um, you know, those games were, you know, big money games for our institution. Uh, but at the same time, we wanted to get our guys an experience that they'll never forget. Um, the Michigan State, the St. Louis, and, of course, the Duke game, those are three – you know, big money games for us. And uh, I thought we fared, you know, decent. You know, we didn't win the ball games, but I thought we competed. Uh, we played both Michigan State and um, and uh, St. Louis, uh, even in the second half. And, of course, the Duke uh, had a 12-point lead in the first half. With a five, um, had a 12-point lead late first half and uh, had a five-point lead at halftime. Um, and that doesn't happen too often. They came in the indoor stadium. They're usually the team that dominates you in the first half. But uh, second half, they just imposed their will. And we made some, of course, some mistakes. We have a young group as well, but then we made some, 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 some sophomore mistakes that cost us the ball game. But you know, you know, it was a good experience for us, and we're just trying to now build on what we, you know, done in the preseason, uh, the non-conference, rather, especially with um, our, our our non-conference schedule, and, and take some of the things we learned uh, into OVC play. The yeah. So, you know, the how would you describe Ohio Valley Conference, I guess, play? You know, is there a type of style kind of as relevant or you know prevalent in the league or is there? A- it's a Hunter, it's a guard oriented or league. You know, if you don't have good guards, you're going to struggle. Uh, it's your throwback traditional type of league where you're not going to think you're going to walk into anybody's gymnasium and win because of their record, you know, um, it's a tough league. It's been in existence for over 75 years. Uh, a lot of great players, a lot of great coaches, a lot of tradition in this league. Um, so it's just one of those things where, man, you better have your hard hat, hard hat on every night and and be ready to go because, you know, teams in this league are going to come after you and it's going to be a tough night for you night in and night out. So you played, you know, you, you played at USI and then you got to oversee the transition Actually, you didn't more to play. You were really, really good at USI when you played. And then you got – here, I'll I'll compliment it for you. The, no, I appreciate it. The, and then you got to oversee the transition from D2 to D1. What did that mean for you to come back to USI and then get to oversee that transition, you know, that step up and I guess, the college basketball well, world? Well, I've been a part of some great history here at USI, you know, going back from – you know, stemming back rather from my playing days when we were national champions and runner-ups uh, one year as well. Uh, so that that this this place means a whole lot more to me than than anybody knows, especially because I played here. Uh, but to see, you know, where we are versus where we where we were back in '96 when I was here, um, it's just amazing to watch everything transform the way it is right now, as we grow into this you know second year of division Division One basketball. Uh, but to be a part and be at the helm of the program as we make this transition, uh, it, it means the world to me because I love this place dearly. And, you know, we, we, it's going to get better at some point, but right now we're still in, in our early phases. Of course, when you make the jump from, <clears throat> excuse me, Division two to Division one, um, there's a four-year probationary period where you cannot play in the postseason. So that affects a lot of things. That affects your recruiting. Um, you know, that affects you in the court sometime, of course, because you don't have – um, you know, all the guys that, that that that's on the market that you can get your hands on because of the postseason ban. Uh, so there's a lot of variables right now that's in place right now 
And, and I feel like once we, we pass this four year probationary period, um, you will see a lot of improvements uh, in, in our record in, in some of the talent that we can get in here because um, young men want to play in the postseason. And that's one of the biggest things that we struggle with in our recruiting right now. But two more years, man, and I feel like this program is going to take a tremendous jump. So last year you guys were, what, 16 – was 16 and 17 the final record? Yeah, we finished the regular season 500, and right. we, we we made the conference tournament in our first year. And then we we made the postseason, which is the CBI, the college basketball the invitational tournament, and lost in the first round against San Jose State. So um, had some great players in that roster, man. Unfortunately, we lost three to graduation. And four of those guys transferred out, transferred out rather, uh, to different places, and and they're having great careers. And we 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 lost. We averaged what seventy four points last year, and we we lost sixty eight of those seventy four points uh, due to graduation and the transfer portal. So we're only returning six points from a year ago. Uh, a totally new roster, nine new players, uh, what five or six returners, and we we try to you know stay above float here. So you mentioned that you're. Uh, you know, your team's on a bye week. You have more or less a recruiting week. You know, what's, yeah. what is the average or like, what do you work at this point in the season? Is this like in state recruits or what do you do at this time of the year? No, with, with the bye week, you know, for me as a head coach, because I don't get out, out of the state very, very much during the yeah. season. So um, this by we have a bye weekend this weekend and another one coming up in a couple weeks. So I'm going to go out of state. I'm going to hop a plane and, and, and go and, Look at a couple guys we offered, and 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 see if we can you know cover some ground there. The assistants do a great job throughout the season of, of getting out to places, but I very rarely. I don't like missing practice. Um, I like being here for every practice and letting our guys know that we invested in these in our, in our team current team. And again, the bye week we play on Thursday um, uh, against uh, SIUE Edwardsville, and I'll probably hop a plane Friday for the weekend and and, and go catch a couple games out of state. So what's been the uh... The biggest, I guess, challenge or difference jumping from a D two to D one. Well, I, I think the biggest challenge right now is that D two Southern Indiana. We were the the big fish in the small pond, and now the tables are turning with being Division one. Now we're the small fish in the big pond um, as we try to navigate, you know, through these first four years. Um, the transfer that's that's a big issue right now that that these young men can transfer in and out of your programs, the, the, the two-time transfer thing is, is, is a real, real issue for us in college basketball. Uh, NIL money is, 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 is huge, uh, collective, you know, young men are now getting paid, um, by, by local businessmen, um, to perform at your institution. So those things are huge now. It's a different world, uh, different landscape rather of a uh, college basketball versus what it was, you know, years ago. And we as coaches have to adjust to that, you know, as these young men um, try to figure out what their worth is due to name, image, likeness. Uh, we as coaches got to try to find people who are, are interested in our guys in that aspect and, and see if we can land a uh, three, four or five star recruit because we can, you know, get NIL money for these guys, you know, but it's on the guys to get that money, but, you know, just put them in a position to get the money, I would say, versus getting the money. You know, we got to make sure that, you know, on our end, there are people that want to support in that in that way and, and try to navigate our guys to the right people to help those guys out in, in that aspect. Yeah, I kind of touched on this a little bit earlier about how impressive the going 500 and, you know, going 16, 17 on the year 500 and regular season play was last year. Were you surprised about how well your team played early last year? Because you had a tough game against Missouri. You had a tough game against Notre Dame. You beat Bowling Green. Were you surprised of how... I guess prepared you got you guys were for you know uh, not really one. man not really uh, I think once we got the league play I was not I was surprised early on but I wasn't surprised once we got the league play uh, if you think about the makeup of our roster last year we had a lot of guys that were you know two three year four year guys in the program and it was much easier you know these guys have been scratching at the bit to play Division one opponents you know Jacob Polakovich was third in the country last year in rebounding. And, you know, he was with me at Indianapolis and he transferred here with me. Uh, Trevor Lakes uh, was with me in Indianapolis, transferred to Nebraska in the Big Ten and came back. Jelani Simmons uh, was at Youngstown State. Uh, Jeremiah Hernandez was at Kent State. Um, so we, we had some guys in this roster that had Division One experience. Nick Hiddle was at Indiana State. So we had some Division One experienced guys. 
it was just a matter of us coming together as one and finding ways to, you know, ways to win. And I'd say that Jacob Polakovic was our, our our best leader last year in terms of how hard he played, but also his vocal leadership. He held guys accountable, and guys kind of followed that. You know, Trevor Lakes is one of the best shooters in the country. Um, Isaiah Swope was one of the best scorers in the league. He was a first team all league player uh, last year, but he transferred to Indiana State. So we had some tools. It was just a matter of us, you know, believing and um, you know coming together. Is the uh... How big of an adjustment is getting used to the transfer portal in general? Uh, just, it's, it... It, it's huge. You know, when I was at D2, uh, we could take guys uh, from Division One because they had to sit out if they stayed at this level. Now they can play right away. So there's no more uh, sitting a year. They can play right away. So that that's hard. You know, every time we think we got our hands on a kid, a bigger school comes in and kind of sweeps them out of our, out of our hands. So – um, but you got to have quantity. You got to have a lot of guys on your on your recruiting board, so that way, uh, if, if that does happen, and it happens quite often, uh, we got to go to our Plan B, Cs, and sometimes Ds, Es, and Fs. The uh, what have you been most surprised with with this group, knowing it as a young group? So, you know what what surprised you, I guess, pleasantly the most? Um, that we haven't hung our heads yet, despite the slow start. You know, um, the attitudes are still great. The motivation is still there. The drive is still there. Um, you know, I coached some teams and, and seen some teams that have haven't had success and practice was hard. You know, guys started feeling sorry for themselves, but not this group. These guys, they still believe. Um, you know, and that showed a couple of nights ago against Tennessee State. Um, so they still believe, and that's what surprised me the most. The you know, you played under uh when you're at USI, you played under a, pre- a pretty good coach. You know, he's he's done some things. Uh, <laughs> and Bruce Pearl. And uh, so was there was there anything that you subconsciously or consciously picked up on uh, that he did as a coach that you've tried to apply? Uh, you know, in- I, I I think for me, Hunter, the, the biggest thing with me with, with Coach Pearl was the player-coach relationship. Uh, that meant a lot to me. Um we just talked about any and everything, you know, when we practice, it was serious. Um, he pushed me, he held me accountable. When, but as soon as practice was over, it was like, we never had that practice because we were able to, you know, relate a whole lot off the court. Um, and there were some days in practice where it was not, I was not my best. Some games I was not my best, but he didn't take that off the court. You know, he, 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 you know, found a way to, um, just be himself around us and allowed us to be ourselves. And I think that's the biggest thing for me, excuse me, is, is, is making sure our player coach relationship is a hundred percent real and authentic. Um, and I'm never going to quit doing that. You know, I, I love being around the guys in the locker room. Um, I always tell them I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to praise you when you're right, but I'm going to really be hard on you when you're wrong. You know what I mean? In terms of whatever that may be. And, I found a way to, over the course of my 20 plus years of coaching, just create some unique bonds with some guys that have came to my program that uh, I still talk to to this day. And um, I just enjoy that part of it, man, just building relationships with young men and helping these guys attain their dreams and goals in life, not just on the basketball court. So you, when you played, you transferred from uh, John A. Logan, right? That's correct. That's yeah. correct. Duh. And so what was that process like when you, tr- when you, you know, uh, transferred what was that process like uh, <laughs> it was uh you know it was quite a, a recruiting process I was a, a older guy who had been playing college basketball for a couple of years and I was a junior college all-american and had a chance to play division one basketball um, Illinois uh, New Mexico uh, Ohio State with some of the schools that inquired about me and I was pretty close to going to Illinois um, but uh, I later found out that I had one year of uh, Division One basketball or two years of Division Two because my clock, my eligibility clock had started ticking. And so it came down to Division Two because I needed to play basketball to earn my degree. Um, I just felt like, you know, even though I lived only 28 miles from the University of Illinois, um, and that's where I wanted to go. Uh, but the, the bigger picture was my college degree. And... I felt like if I'd have went to a school one year to play, I would have never finished my degree because basketball motivated me in the classroom. 
Um, so I had a ton of Division IIs uh, recruiting me, Cal State, Bakersfield, uh, Metro State, Southern Indiana, Kentucky. I mean, just every detail in the country. Um, I think one thing that stuck, stuck out of, stood out of my mind rather <clears throat> when coming to uh, to, to, to when coming to USI that made me come here was uh, I had a knee, a serious knee injury and it required surgery uh, at my junior college. And I'll never forget coming out of surgery. Um, when I opened my eyes from anesthesia, there was my parents and uh, there was Coach Pearl and Coach Hurtis. And uh, I think from that day, I'm like, I'm playing for those guys because they they cared. You know, they, they drove, they took the 100 mile drive to, you know, be there for me at my darkest hour at that time. And, and I just, I just, something about what they did just meant a lot to me. Um, Coach Hurts was the lead recruit on me um, when I um, was at John A. Logan. And he made it a point every week to come and see me. Um, even, you know, it just goes like relationships. Uh, even um, when I finished playing pro basketball, uh, who gives me my first job? Rick Curtis. You know, he's a reason I'm coaching, you know, because uh, he gave me a chance. So, but those relationships, man, they mean so much to me. Um, uh, and, and that's why I came because of the relationship that um, I built with those two guys. So coming out of high school, was playing professionally even really a thing you thought about? No, not at all. Um, you know, I I was just an average player in high school in my eyes and, and ended up going to junior college after a couple of years and, and um went to Johnny Logan College, was an all American and, and ended up coming to USI. <clears throat> and we were national runner ups in, in my very first year here. And um my second year, uh I started to see the light. You know, I was a national player of the year my 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 junior year. Um, and going into my senior year, um, there were scouts calling uh, at practices, at games. Uh, these are NBA scouts. And that's when I started to, you know, see the light at the end of the tunnel. Um, and then senior year happens. Um, you know, I'm sorry, junior year happens. We win the national championship. And then, you know, my name is out there. You know, I'm seeing, uh, reading Streets and Smith magazines about, you know, NBA prospect and the possibility. And, Finally, you know, sit down with Coach Pearl about my dreams. You know, I wanted to play pro basketball. And I didn't know how far this would go. And, and you know, fast forward to the end of my senior year, um, we were 28 and four, and I was a national player for the second year in a row. And at that point, I, I think I'm going to make it to the NBA and um, hired an agent. And we, we got the ball rolling, and, and this was a 96 class. Now, this was the best NBA Watch draft over. class ever. Yeah, that's the best class ever. And I'll never forget watching the, the NBA draft because my agent at the time thought I was going to be a second-round second, second round pick. And watching that draft at home in my apartment down the street with, with my girlfriend, who's now my wife, um, it was it was a tough night, man. And, and But, you know, I just I prayed about it, and I knew that, this is not what God had in the picture for me. And, and I ended up going to um, the uh, USBL. It was it was a minor league, uh, kind of like a lot of the NBA players who don't get drafted go. In fact, uh, I think I got drafted. If you remember the name Derek Fisher, yeah, um, yeah. he got drafted. I think I got drafted before Derek, maybe two spots above Derek Fisher uh, for the Idaho Stamp, uh, for the, um, not the Idaho Stamp, uh, it's a team in Portland, Maine. I forgot the name of the team. But I got drafted on that team when I hadn't played and, and came back. And I was later sent overseas to Sweden and came back from Sweden. Um, Sons of all Sweden, rather. I played in Sweden and then came back and, and tried the CBA, which is now the G League. And I was playing for the Idaho Stampede. And um, I was having a really good preseason. And, you know, NBA players uh, got shipped to Donald Royal. Uh, was on the Orlando Magic. He got cut from the Magic, and he came down to the Stampede, and they sent me packing. So reality started to set in. You know, I was going to give this thing a couple more years um, at the European level to see if I could possibly make the NBA. You know, did a uh, a camp for the Atlanta Hawks, and I was out there, I think, with Ben Wallace, I do believe. He was in camp with me, who, who was uh, with the Detroit Pistons. He was a D2 guy as well. Another and, 96 uh, class guy. Yeah, yeah, another 96 class guy. Yeah, he played at uh, Virginia Union. Yep. Um, but, you know, just things started to happen. You know, 
you know, fast forward, you know, I'm playing overseas my second year, uh, sustained a, a, a third or fourth knee injury. At that point, I'm like, I don't know if this is going to work out. I just got tired of, you know, going down, getting hurt, rebuilding my body back up, and then, you know, getting hurt again. That, that mentally, uh, that took a tremendous toll on me and my body physically. Uh, so year three, same thing. I was going to go back, you know, and give it another shot. And I had people still calling my agent at the time, NBA teams, but just could never get another tryout. And so after year four, um, I needed six hours to finish my undergrad degree here at USI. And I told myself, I'm going to take this class online, these classes online. And if I can finish up uh, in the year, I want to walk away from basketball, um, walk away from basketball while I have my degree. So that was the plan and it worked out perfectly. Um, I, I finished playing. I took a job as an academic advisor at Johnny Logan College uh, for a year. Uh, coach Pearl gets a job at Wisconsin, Milwaukee. Rick Curtis becomes a head coach here at USI. Rick Curtis calls me to um, come on board with him here at USI. Myself and Mark Hostetter played for him. And, you know, I was here for a year with him. Then I went to the University of Indianapolis as an assistant coach for three years. I left there and went and worked for uh, Royce Waltman at Indiana State um, for a couple of years. Um, and then in 2012, I took over the program at the University of Indianapolis as head coach. And I was there 12 years and then and left there to come here. So my entire coaching career has been in the state of Indiana. You know, so I, I know the state like the back of my hand, believe it or not. The, you know, you, you mentioned that, you know, NBA teams are still calling you a few years after, I guess, yeah. what your dra draft class will have been. Just because I don't know, and I guess I'm ignorant to it. How does that kind of process work with your agent? Does your agent just kind of get contacted that? The yeah, he, he reaches out. out or... Yeah, he he shots me around. He reaches out, and he, uh, you know, he, when 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 I was playing, Coach Pearl and Hurtis, you know, shot me around. And then uh, once I signed with an agent, you know, he had enough connections to say, "Hey, here's a guy that should be on your radar." And send my bio and my stats over to him. And I think they did that my junior year. Which is why you know uh, uh, teams and and and, and uh, uh, organizations were coming to my practices and games. Uh, I'll never forget. I was uh, coaching at University of Indianapolis, and Jerry Reinsdorf. We were playing the. Uh, we were playing. I was a head coach at University of Indianapolis, and Jerry Reinsdorf from the Bulls was at a Wisconsin Parkside game, watching uh, the Saffold kid they had. And as I'm walking out, we catch we catch eyes, and he says. Um, did you play at Southern Indiana? I'm like, yeah. He said, Stan Girard? He's like, yes. And he said, um, we came and watched you play quite a bit, but how are those knees? <laughs> you know, because he knew about my knees. That's why I, I didn't get drafted. I had so many knee injuries. And I told him they were good. You know, I told I, and I later joked at him. I said, you made a mistake, <laughs> you know. But um, but it was pretty cool, man, for that to happen. You know, my players saw it all, man. It was pretty cool conversation. But um, no, man, the process is – is it's uh, – uh, um, unique process, man, and, and people, uh, your agents rather, they do a great job of putting your putting your name out there to try to get your get your name on the draft board or either on the radar. I was gonna say the uh, recovering from that many knee injuries in the uh, '90s is pretty impressive because up, you know, they really haven't <laughs> perfected that science. No, not until at all. Recently, really. No, right, and uh, we have young men that have surgery and they bounce back in in. Six weeks, you know, yeah. uh, my very first knee surgery, I missed the entire season. Uh, my second knee surgery, I, I did it when the season's over. I was out the whole summer. I had four knee surgeries on my left knee. So it, it, I'm telling you, man, it was – if we had the technology back then that we have now, who knows? You know, who knows where, where I'd be playing at right now. Yeah, the – so I guess because – I guess you're qualified, on your opinion, is, is it harder for a D2 player – to get you think looked at drafted now compared to then with this the surge of all that are avenues no not anymore uh it used to be hard you know you you think of you think about you know myself i was a two-time national player of the year and guys now are, are probably getting drafted or, or, or getting more calls to nba camps uh there's a, there was a young man at johnny logan college that um went to the nba um uh, a year ago so it, it's 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 more doable now than what it was back in the 90s. You know, there's so much technology out there now uh, in terms of being seen um, that um, it's easier for these guys. The So 
you know, kind of coming back to, I guess, uh, present day, I mean, you mentioned you coached, you know, your assistant coach at ISU. W when you play them, is that like a, I guess, do you enjoy playing ISU? Oh, yeah, of course. It's a homecoming, man. Uh, we played them. I didn't like getting beat by them the way I did this year, but uh, it was a homecoming, you know, to go back and see so many familiar faces. Um, it's pretty cool. Um, a lot of those people, especially the administrators, they're still there, and I still stay in touch with all those guys there. So it's like a homecoming, man, to go back there and, and see some uh, some friendly faces, you know. Um, so it was pretty cool. The, and I guess because of the, I guess the Bruce Pearl connection has has there been an attempt, or I guess what would a game against Auburn mean for you? Well, we've done that, you know. Uh, when I was at D two Indianapolis, uh, Pearl was at Tennessee. We beat those guys. D two, they were nineteen in the country. And we beat them 109, 109-114, I do believe. Um, no, no, I take that back. I'm sorry. We beat them by 14 points when he was at Tennessee. Um, then I go back when he when he leaves college basketball and works for ESPN and gets a job at Auburn. I was still at the University of Indianapolis at the time. Uh, we went down and lost to those guys in, in overtime, 109 to 114. And um, so I take the job here at USI. So two years ago, uh, we took our team down to Auburn plus about 150 USI fans and played Auburn down there as well. So we've played those guys a few times. Now i got to get him to bring his Auburn team to USI. I think that would be pretty cool. Well, here, I guess I can refresh it. What would it mean on the a D1 versus D1 level to have a – That would be pretty cool, man. That would be pretty cool. Um, you know, when we played them last time, it was we were D2, of course, but to be D1 to go play against those guys at the same level, I think that would be uh, a historic moment for our program. The – Honestly, uh, you know, right now, uh, you know, your, your team, you don't get off to the hottest start, but conference right. play in college basketball is really what matters is the conference play. The so, what are you trying? I guess, what are you telling your team right now? Because there are a bunch of you know younger guys to try, I guess, get them centered and get them back on. Uh, you know, you mentioned they haven't hung their head. What are you saying to get them back on track? And you, you know, know stay, stay, stay the course. Um, you know, we can still. You know, set our foot in, in, in the sand uh, for OVC play. Um, you know, we played like I said, the toughest one of the toughest schedules. I think we were 68th in the country in toughest schedules, and that should make you tougher from a, from a mental and a physical standpoint. Um, but we got to stay the course. You know, we can't hang our heads on. We can't change what happened. We can change the narrative going forward. And we're two and two in league play. Uh, had a chance to be three and one. Um, but, you know, things happen. Um, and the ball don't bounce away every time. But, you know, this is this is a game. Basketball is a game. Uh, life is going to be a whole lot tougher than this once you get to be my age. And, and these guys got to have to understand that um, if we just go out and compete at a high level every day and defend at a high level, um, we're going to give ourselves a chance to win. And that's all you can ask for. If you, you, you can't go in, in any game with any doubt in your mind, um, no matter who you play, how good they are, you got to think that you can beat these guys. And that's the confidence we as coaches, we try to instill in our guys every single day um, through practice, through words, through, through patting them on the back for, for doing great things. So uh, we're going to keep doing that. You know, we had a, we got a fine group of young men here that, that, that wears the USI red, white, and blue. And I just feel like if we just keep, you know, encouraging our guys the way we are right now, um, we're gonna be okay. We're gonna be just okay. You know. You know. I can uh, cut this part out if I need to. But what has there been any talks about trying to get in? I guess Evansville versus you guys game on some type of, you know, consistent. No, you don't. Basis? You don't have to cut that out. No, you can. You can leave it on. Yeah, we we talked about it. Uh, I met with the coaches at U of E uh, uh, back in the preseason, and we talked about it, but nothing's happened yet. You know, so we still. You know, kind of waiting on those guys. I think the ball is now in their court. You know, we just got to come to terms on on the how. Uh, what I don't want to do is, uh, if we're going to play the game, I don't want to just go to Evansville. I want, I want to do home and homes where they come yeah. here too as well. Um, this city is big enough for two programs. And David's doing a remarkable job this year um, with, with, with his program over there. I coached David, by the way, man. I, I coached him his first year. Uh, so we have a very, very good relationship. But – this city is big enough for two programs here, and I would love to see that game happen uh, sooner rather than later because I think the city needs it, 
And we both programs can benefit from a little bit of rivalry with each other, especially because we're so far down the road, it won't cost very much. Um, I think we could play that game, take half of the money that we uh, that we make at the door and donate to local charities to put some money back into our city. And um, it's going to happen. You know, when, I don't know. Uh, I think David one day is going to call me and say yes to it. But uh, it's out there that we're ready. It's out there that they're ready. It's just a matter of time uh, when we're going to push the button to make it happen, you know. So uh, we have some open dates on our schedule for next year. I'm sure he's got a schedule to put together too as well. Uh, I don't know. We just got to wait and see what those guys decide to do with the balls in their court right now to make that happen. Well, my thought process is it's cheap and it's a mar- an extra marquee game for both of you guys. Absolutely. Absolutely. This So really, I guess just what's your, you know, you mentioned uh, – Ohio Valley, very guard oriented, which I think most smaller, I would guess, are most smaller conferences, you think, maybe guard oriented just because. I, I'd say, I mean, any program in the country, if you look at teams, if your guard play is not on point, man, you're not going to win very many ball games because those guys handle the ball the most. Um, we have a big, we got some big guys. Uh, we have 6'11, 6'10, 6'9, 6'8, a couple 6'7 guys, but uh, the guards, or or where you are going to where you going to win ball games at you know uh, any any really really big skilled big man uh, is probably going to go up a level or two. You know we have some skilled guys that we're fortunate to have, um, but any any really five star guys going to go to a bigger level of schools. The you know what you know so I guess what was have you tried to keep your you know the four years you've been here have you tried to keep your system pretty. Uh, consistent. I know yes, absolutely. You know, we personnel. we change it. We change it occur occasionally, but for the most part, our base. You know, our defensive principles are the same. Um, we we may throw in some sprinkling, some extra plays, or some different tactics uh, defensively. But uh, I think our base, uh, the, the base is, is is pretty much the same. We don't try to reinvent the wheel. Uh, we just want to get better at what we're currently doing. No, I'll ask this question because this is interesting. Have you ever gone to recruit someone and then when you're there, you notice someone else lets you kind of piques your interest? Oh, yeah. Uh, one of my best players I've ever coached, uh, his name is Brennan McElroy. Uh, I coach him at the University of Indianapolis. And we, my assistant coach had been recruiting his teammate for about a year. And um, so I finally get down to go watch Brennan McElroy. And they were playing – I mean, I watched this kid play, not Brennan. I was watching the other kid, his teammate, the point guard. And I'm watching the game. I'm like, who is this this tall, skinny kid that's jumping everywhere and taking four – taking five char- – he, t- he took five charges. He's playing against Miles Leonard. And um, I told my assistant, you're recruiting the wrong guy. Um, and that guy was Brennan McElroy. So we bring Brennan in to the University of Indianapolis, and he turned out to be an All-American and play pro basketball overseas, you know? So yeah, it happens all the time. You just, it's one of those things where uh, you never know who's watching. And when you're out there, man, you got to play like you, like it's your last game because there's always somebody watching. And, and that's how we found him. He was never recruited by anyone. And we brought him in. He was an All-American at the Division II level at uh, the University of Indianapolis. Where did Myers Leonard go to high school? Uh, I forgot where. Right? Yeah, right. It's yeah. Robinson. Yep, yeah, exactly. Yep. My I have one of my best friends is from Robinson. I'm like, I think that's yeah. right. The yeah, I think the, it is. So you know, also a former University of Illinois. Uh, yeah, everything yep. ties together. Yep. <laughs> the, yep. It sure the, does. So you know, I'm just curious about schedule making because it's so you know the way you guys do it. So you know, fascinating to me. But the when do you get your schedule? You know, set like when do you really know like. Well, right, right, like right now, let's just say today. Uh, yep. I have about five or six schools right now that's on hold that have called us, and these are high major programs, um, like the levels of your Dukes and Michigan States. Yeah. Um, I know for a fact that we need, we can play, we'll play two nine D ones. Uh, we'll play our twenty game schedule next year, so there's twenty two games already in place. Uh, I'll need about six more games. Um, I'll play two of those bigger D1 schools, uh, and then I'll look for three other games that, you know, against like opponents, uh, non-conference as well. Uh, we fi- we signed a four-year agreement with Indiana State. Uh, we'll be finishing our last year. We signed a three-year deal with 
uh, um, Southern Illinois, Carbondale, and Purdue, Fort Wayne. So we'll finish those next year. But scheduling, man, you just hop on the phone and call and see if anybody has any interest in playing. You can either do buy games or you can either do home and homes. You know, so you have many options. So, so, so do you have a chart in your head where it's like I want to? And you kind of mentioned I want to play to a. I'm just saying schools. This is I don't have any side info. Right, like Bama, Duke, Kentucky, and then yeah, we need we we have to play two of those games because yeah. those are big money games for us. You know, so we'll play we'll play two high major programs, yeah. preferably opening day because opening day, uh, you you can really um, earn a earn a good dollar. Uh, for playing yeah. on opening day. And then you go down to a few games versus, and I'm not disparaging anyone here, we'll, you, we'll do UNT because they won the NIT, but we'll right. do North, North Texas. So do you just have that? And do you call, like, how many schools do you think you call? In a... We we have a, one of my assistant coaches does scheduling. So I'll tell him what I'm looking for. You know, we, uh, like, for example, we met last week. I told him I wanted two high major programs and, and, and I need two like opponents that – you know, at our level in that ballpark of, you know, 25 to 50 in the Ken Palm ratings. So that way, you know, we can play some like opponents and give ourselves an opportunity to win. Are you wary about how much you travel in terms of like not taking a game in, I don't know, South Florida because of the travel? Well, we, we flew to, we flew to, we flew to Duke. Uh, we flew to LaSalle and Bucknell. Uh, I think the biggest thing with me with on those, those, those trips like that is, missing class you know i think yeah. if we can get some of those on the weekend i'd be okay with it you know so if you look at our opening game this year and a year ago uh at missouri we played missouri of course and then we played st louis those are drivable games yeah. uh opening weekend so we we were able to um you know hop a bus and drive over there the night before and play the game you know this year for the LaSalle, bucknell and duke game we were going nine days um, I'll never do that again. You know, that took a toll on our guys, man, from a physical standpoint. So I, I'll never do that again. But it made most the most it made more sense financially to to go play LaSalle and Bucknell and then stay out versus coming back because it was Thanksgiving break as well. For I look I've looked at your schedule last couple of years. Have you gone to the West Coast at all or my mistake? No. No, yeah, we have not either. not did no. the West Coast. Is that and those are hard, man? I, that's something I don't think I'll be doing no time soon. Yeah, that a conscious. We, we gotta, actually, I got a call. I got a call from uh, San Diego State a couple of days ago, and I, I turned it down because that's gonna it'd be too hard to get out there for us unless we charter a plane. We're not doing that yet. Yeah, I was gonna. I was gonna. Say, I guess in the San Jose State, notwithstanding, I guess you played almost no West Coast teams. You, we played San Jose State um, in Daytona. Neutral site. Yeah, yeah, neutral site. Correct. The, the but I mean. So, I mean, really looking, you know, this right now in this part of the year, you know, kind of conference play, I guess, what's your, you know, big, you know, what's your big thing? I, well, no, here, let me reword this. I guess, does your coaching style change from the earlier games to the conference games? Yeah, as you learn about your team, um, as you learn about yourself, as you learn – um, what you're good and not good at, yeah, you change a lot of things. You tweak some things, you know. Um, but the style of coaching, no, I'm still intense. Uh, I'm still demanding. Uh, I'm still going to push you. Uh, but we may tweak some things in terms of how we some, – some of our game schemes, of course. We do those from game to game all the time. I was going to say, is there anyone you try to mo you try to model your coaching style after? No, nah, no. I just no. work for – I work for Bruce Pearl. I work for Royce Waldman. I work for Todd Sturgeon. I work for Kevin McKenna. I work for Rick Hurtis. I played for Tom Ashman. I played for Bruce Pearl. Uh, I played for Gene Corley. And it's just a mix of all those guys, you know, in terms of what they did, good or bad. You, you, you learn what to do. You learn what not to do. So I just kind of have my own style. I don't want to be anybody else. I want to be the best version of myself. And uh, that's what I try to do every day. Now, you may see some some offense or some defense in terms of what Pearl did. I played in that system, and I believe in it. Um, you'll see some of uh, Waltman's toughness. You'll see some of Hurtis's, um his up-tempo style of play. So you see a little bit, little bit of everything. But it's it's just me being myself and, uh, again, trying to, trying to be the best I can be to serve our student-athletes. The Has there been any – 
I don't know how to say it, cohesion of other spro uh, sports programs at USI, I guess, communicating about, I don't know, the transition you guys made. Uh, we talk periodically, you know, yeah. we, we always talk about it and it's, it's a pretty cool process to, to share with some of your coworkers. Uh, we talk about it, but it's never complaining. It's just always trying to find a way to help each other out. Well, I was going to ask you, you know, USI baseball has been good for a while. Oh, yeah. I wonder if there's any type of inner competition with you guys to kind of catch, you know, what baseball is doing. Cause baseball has been good forever. No, no, not at all, man. I, I, I always joke at those guys. I always say, I always sing the song. Sometime I dream that he is me. Uh, I want to be like those guys, you know, uh, women's basketball is killing it right now. They, they are five and on league play, uh, softball, uh, baseball. They've been great over the years. You know, we have one national championship in basketball at the D2 level, uh, one runner up at the D2 level, but it's a new level now. And we all are what I call trying to level up uh, to push each other in a positive way to, to, to win ball games and be, become a national champ or a league champ. Uh, the support here amongst the coaches, amongst the coaches is unreal. Um, we pull for each other, man, like no one I ever worked for, man. These coaches, you know, you win a big game, you get a text, you lose a big game, they send you words of encouragement. Um, and it's, it's a pretty good atmosphere to be in. You know, we have some tr tr tremendous support um, from your, your your peers, your uh, administration, your president, you know, across the board. It's a great environment to be in, and I can't imagine being anywhere else. <clears throat> I know on your side you said you are you guys kind of were ready for a transition, but that's almost across any sport that I could think of, about as smooth as a transition from D2 to D1 for a first year. I've seen, I mean, obviously James Madison football this year is like its, yeah. own, its own thing, but like, I think going 500 is pretty regular. See, that's pretty impressive for I'm, I'm, I'm sure, I don't know what the, the preseason polls and stuff like that were, but I'm sure that the, I'm sure you surpassed expectations. Of course, of course we did. Um, you know, we, we put high expectations on ourselves, pressure on ourselves to be great. And our guys did a wonderful job last year of, Coming in year one and 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 kind of exceeding those, you know, we had no pressure on us to win, um, you know, because it was our first year and we took a lot of people by storm. The we kind of talked about and maybe and and maybe this is, these are some of the schools you mentioned. You know, there's there's a few schools which down here, you know, the Evans schools obviously have support, but UK, IU, Purdue all have massive fan bases here. Has there been any attempt to try to drag? Uh, you know, get any of those schools down here or uh, up here. Uh, they're, they're not going to do that. They they no, they no. they're going to lose so much money coming here. I would love yeah. for that to happen, but I don't I don't think that's possible at all because they'll lose so much money coming. I here. I didn't think so, but you know, it's worth asking. The yeah. Well, I mean, or even you going up there because still, uh, you know that. I, I guess have they contacted you at any point for uh, you know. Uh, pay games i'll use the quote oh yeah of course yeah we get those calls all the time i mean everybody's calling um and we just got to navigate through some things and and see what best fits um fits our 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 schedule and then we'll go from there but you know we'll probably be announcing our schedule i, I say early or uh, late spring rather in terms of what we're going to do uh the ovc has got to release the schedule too as well but we we got some time and we'll we'll figure it out we'll figure it out man but um um, I'm excited about this year. I'm excited about next year and what's going to happen here going forward. Well, that's really all I have prepared question-wise. Okay. Uh, is, is there anything you want to say, Coach? No. Uh, if you haven't come out to see a game, man, please um, come out and see us. You know, we we have uh, uh, quite the schedule, quite the team. And it's, it's a nice setup. Um, seats about 4,800. Um, so please come out and see us. If you, um, We have a radio show on Monday nights. Um, on WREF at seven o'clock, uh, it's a Stan Gerard radio show um, uh, live at Toronto's. If you want to come out some night to seven o'clock, but we have a lot going on here uh, on the basketball side. Uh, every program, you know, we have a lot of things going on here, and please support USI basketball as we transition um, to 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 Division One. Man, this is year two, and I think we're going to finish finish this year with a bang, and and next year is going to be much more better. Well, this has been Hunter Wade at. Uh, with the Afro-Lasagne Podcast. Thanks for coming on, Coach. Thank you, Wade. Appreciate you having me. Hey, guys. This is Hunter Wade with the Athletes Lounge Podcast. Please like, share, and subscribe where you can. Thanks.